It's Baltimore City Council Budget and Appropriations Committee. We're here for Council Bill 19-0386, Ordinance of Estimates for the Fiscal Year Ending June 30th, 2020, for the purpose of providing the appropriations estimated to be needed by each agency of the City of Baltimore for operating programs and capital projects during the fiscal 2020 year. Um, Councilman Eric Costello from the 11th District, Chair of the Committee. To my left is Vice Chair of the Committee, Councilman Leon Pickett from the 7th District. To his left, Councilman Bill Henry, a 4th District member of the Committee. We're also joined by Jeff Amaros, representing Mayor Jack Young. Uh, Rebecca Tab, which is counsel to the City Council, Marguerite Curran, who is staff to the committee, to my immediate right, and I think I got everyone for now. Um, Bob, you got a presentation? Take it away. Bob, how long do you expect your presentation to be? Probably, uh, like, can keep it to 20, 25 or 30 keep minutes. Keep it to 20 if possible? Sure, sure. All right, thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Bob Senemi, Budget Director for the City, and here today uh, to present the uh, Fiscal 20 kickoff uh, overview of the Fiscal 20 budget for the City Council. So um, first off, the agenda for today, um, first I'll do a quick overview um, of the budget. I'll talk in a little bit more detail about the general fund outlook, uh, both the revenue side and on the expenditure side, our, fi our key fixed costs. Uh, then we'll get into some, uh, a little bit more detail about the budget recommendations, some of the key highlights uh, that are in the budget, and then we'll talk about other, uh, other fund sources. Um, just before we jump in, a reminder, this um, uh, overview today is really meant to uh, mirror the first budget publication, the executive summary, and of course all the hearings next week are agency-specific hearings where we have those, uh, what we call the agency detail publication. So I'm happy to take questions today uh, about the budget. If there's more detailed questions about specifics in the agencies, those we can save for, for next week. Um, so, so first things first, an overview. Um, the the uh, ordinance of estimates that we've submitted for consideration by the council uh, includes $2.9 billion in the operating side, on the operating side, $627 million on the capital side, total recommendation of $3.55 billion across all funds. Uh, it's a 3.9% increase on the operating side and a 7.9% decline on the capital side. Uh, the capital budget, just a reminder, fluctuates quite a bit from year to year because there are timing issues, especially on the borrowing of money uh, in the water and wastewater utility funds and the timing of projects. So that's not a, a reduction of service. Um, looking at the general fund only, a growth of 4.5%, uh, recommendation of $1.96 billion overall, and uh, just under a 1% increase in budgeted positions. A um, couple highlights uh, first, and we'll come back to these in a little bit more detail. There's, there's $375 million of support for city schools. Um, this budget supports HCD's community development framework. Uh, it begins uh, a much needed, we think, modernization of the police department. Uh, we have $145 million of general funds uh, capital spending, which is uh, the most we've had in over a decade. Uh, and there's increased funding uh, for the city's digital transformation plan for IT investments. Um, first, just looking at the, uh, the general fund outlook. So in the fall, uh, our staff builds what we call current level of service outlook for the city to try to figure out what it will cost to maintain current services and what our revenues look like. And I'll start on the, on the revenue side. Uh, just a reminder, about half of our general fund revenues, of course, come from property tax. Um, the next highest uh, portion is income tax at 18.6%, and then highway user revenues at about 8%. After that, um, all those other sources are pretty minimal. So I'll focus on the larger revenue sources and what the outlook is for, for fiscal 20 and the general fund first. Um, so general fund overall, you can see, is uh, pretty much slow and steady growth, and this mirrors uh, what we've seen in the, in the national economy. Um, uh, we have had uh, t essentially 10 years since the last recession. We're actually, uh, the national economy is 10 years into a, a growth period. It is, in another month, it will be the longest growth period uh, post-World War II. And so our uh, general fund revenues have mirrored that with slow and steady growth. Um, looking just first at the property tax revenue side, our largest source, we had, um, from fiscal 11 to fiscal 14, we had four years of uh, actually during those years of declining assessments of values in that time. The reason our revenue didn't drop significantly uh, during that four-year period is because we had built up some value, value prior to the recession. 
uh, that we were able to tax uh, even when the assessments lost value. And then since then, from fiscal 15 to fiscal 20, we've had six straight years of uh, assessment growth. Uh, properties are assessed in three groups. This year we're assessed, uh, group one was what was reassessed. That group one is the northern part of the city. Uh, so think of it west to east, it's uh, Park Heights, um, Homeland, and then uh, neighborhoods in the far northeast, Hamilton, Laraville, Frankfurt. Um, those were the ones that were reassessed this year. And the growth uh, we're seeing in group one is 8.4%. Uh, so again, uh, four years of assessment declines from 11 to 14, and now we're in our sixth straight year of assessment growth, which is, which is positive news for the city. Um, additionally, on the property tax side, the fiscal 20 budget marks, uh, marks a key milestone that we've met in our property tax reduction uh, milestone. So we had, the idea of this program was to reduce the effective rate for owner-occupied properties by 20 cents by 2020. Uh, that means, uh, uh, our property tax, our base property tax rate is $2.24 per $100 of assessed value. For a homeowner, for an owner-occupied property, it's now at 2.04 cents per $100 uh, of assessed value. So we have met that 20 cents by 2020 uh, benchmark. Uh, it's something we'd like to continue to do, but we'll evaluate it, of course, on a year-to-year -year basis to see what we can afford. Uh, the total uh, cost of this program, it's costing the city $36 million annually to provide that relief uh, to our taxpayers. On the income so tax side, which is our second largest source of revenue, um, you know, a similar story to the general fund overall and that we've seen continual growth. We have seen our income tax base strengthen considerably. Uh, we look at census data. Um, we look at um, income tax data that's shared at the state, uh, that's grouped from the state. For, uh, we can't see individual returns, of course, but we can see group data. And both of those uh, po points of data show that our base has strengthened, that we have higher uh, net earners living and locating in the city. Um, for fiscal 20, uh, our, we take our cues from the state forecast, and the state forecasters have urged us to be cautious. The State Board of Revenue Estimates actually downgraded their forecast for fiscal 20, mostly just around the uncertainty of the federal tax reform. They're starting to see people file their taxes, and because there were significant changes, uh, they, they, are, they are warning that there's caution that there could be lower spending patterns in the near future, but we'll see how that plays out uh, when we get into fiscal 20. On highway user revenues, uh, a significant increase of about $15 million from 19 to 20. That's because the state law changed and Baltimore City's share of these revenues uh, has grown from 7.7% to 8.3%. Uh, that looks good in that view, uh, but when you look at the longer view, uh, this is a, a, a significant decline versus what we had pre-recession level. So we're about uh, nearly $70 million less of highway user revenue than we had before the Great Recession. And that's because the state kept a portion of that revenue for their own general fund and for their own transit projects. And the result for us is that we just have, a, have had significantly less to spend on transportation capital projects. Uh, on traffic cameras, you can see the trend here, uh, F FY11 to, th FY to 13, uh, over $20 million each of those years of receipts. Then the program, of course, was turned off. Uh, it's turned back on, so we've kept the budget flat between fiscal 19 and 20 because as we discussed earlier at the third quarter hearing, we are seeing, we do plan to add cameras and get to 100 speed and 100 red light cameras overall, but the number of citations we're issuing per camera, uh, there's been a significant drop off. We've seen that even in fiscal, uh, fiscal 19 so far, so we don't expect more revenue beyond that. On the, those are the key items on, on revenues. Again, remind you that in the executive summary, we have even more details about a lot of those revenue sources if there's further questions about those. On the expenditure side, uh, first on our fixed costs. So we like to look at our budget and, and first count the things that we have to pay in the next fiscal year. These are things that we have influence over in the long term, but in the short term, we have to budget for these. Um, and the, the four categories are pension, uh, retiree health costs, debt service, and then the BCPS uh, required contribution for the schools. Uh, other includes other things like utility bills, uh, workers' compensation uh, payments, things that we can't turn off in the short term. And the trend here has also been positive. 
Uh, we like to measure our fixed costs as a percent of our total general fund revenue. Gives us a sense of how much money we have for discretionary spending. And you can see uh, that since fiscal 12, uh, it's been a decline uh, in each year. Uh, and we're now at the 43, 44% of fixed costs as a percent of general fund revenues. And that is because of two things. One is that our general fund revenues have grown, but we've also been able to reduce or limit our cost growth on some key items. Uh, first is ERS contributions on pensions. If you remember, we had the pension reform uh, for civilian employees, which is the blue line, which uh, kind of bent us and, and kind of kept us in the right direction. If you notice between fiscal uh, 11, I'm sorry, fiscal 13 and fiscal 20, our ERS civilian pension costs are essentially flat. On the F&P side, even after the reform in fiscal 10, those costs have continued to grow, but we've been able to dampen the cost growth um, because we've had good returns in the pension fund. And on the healthcare side, there's really two points of inflection that have been beneficial to the city. First was in fiscal 12, going into fiscal 13, we reformed uh, uh, our health benefit plans for employees. At that time, we asked employees to pay a little bit of a higher share of their benefits. We were offering essentially platinum level plans at that point. The plans we have are still generous, but by requiring employees to make, uh, employees to make a larger contribution, that saved the city money. You can see the green line, we started to grow a bit over those next three years, and then in 2018 into 2019, we rebid both our uh, health contracts and our prescription drug contracts, and we got significant savings from that action, especially in fiscal 19 on the prescription drug side. Uh, we've also consolidated our health plans uh, down to four plans. We used to have nine, and we've consolidated them down to just the basics uh, for, for established health plans which has saved us money on administrative costs. So putting all that together, putting the revenue picture together uh, for the general fund and putting the expenditure picture together on the fixed cost, we started the fiscal 20 planning cycle um, with $33 million of resources beyond what was needed to maintain the current level of service. And we, we describe it as a planning surplus. I, have it, I hesitate to even use that word because really what this means, it doesn't mean that all of our needs are, net, our, our needs are met. It just means that when we started the planning cycle, we knew that we could, cr we could maintain the level of service that we were providing in fiscal 19 and have $33 million of additional resources. And I'll show you how most of that, uh, almost all of that was spent on one-time capital investments, which are much needed, which we'll get into uh, a little bit later. So that was kind of the, 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 the starting point for our planning of fiscal, uh, fiscal 2020 budget. In terms of the budget recommendations, um, uh, the budget was organized around the mayor's five pillars, and um, of course we need to acknowledge now that most of the fiscal 20 budget was uh, organized under Mayor Pugh during her term, her five pillars. So the language we use in this, in this slide uh, still re refers to those five pillars. Uh, typically what we do is we meet with the mayor uh, and his or her staff during the uh, uh, budget planning cycle, especially in the late fall, uh, I'm sorry, late summer, early fall. And, and talk about uh, those five pillars and any indicators we want to track. So we'll, of course, do that with President Young, but I just want to acknowledge that a lot of this planning was done with, I'm sorry, Mayor Young. Um, I want to acknowledge that most of the planning for this, of course, was done under Mayor Pugh. And her, four, four, her, her five pillars uh, were education and youth engagement, accountability and transparency, quality of life, public safety, and economic development and jobs. And under each of those pillars, there's indicators that give us an idea of how well the city's doing in those areas and all of that detailed data. Um, you know, things like academic achievement, number of jobs, uh, number of shootings, things of that nature are all published in our executive summary uh, budget document. So what I'd like to do to, to uh, in the next few minutes is just give you some highlights of what's in the budget at, at, at a high level under each of those pillars. Um, first, under education and youth, there's the third contribution into the children and youth fund that uh, fund, of course, is now required by charter. The appropriation this year will be $13 million. Um, on the city school side, city schools side, there is a total of $375 million of support for the city schools. That includes um, operating support. It includes retiree health benefits, uh, school construction costs, and uh, some services that are provided in or near the schools, like health services and crossing guards. Um, Fiscal 20, important note, is this is the final year of the agreed to bridge funding. This is the third and final year. So if you remember going into fiscal 18, uh, the mayor at the time had made a commitment to get the city schools, uh, help the city schools through those three years. 
our contribution over those three years is $99.2 million. In fiscal 20, there will be $38.5 million of support above the fiscal 17 baseline. And we're providing that sum in just cash operating support, and we're also providing some in-kind services to the schools. Uh, school health services and risk management, both of those are things we typically bill the schools for their share of the cost, um, but we're providing those services in-kind, and that expires at the end of fiscal 20. Um, I like to just bring some highlights, too, of what our dollars get us in terms of uh, results. Um, and I'll just highlight a couple things here. Um, uh, in Rec and Parks, we'll provide 4,000 youth with opportunities in the summer rec programs, that first item. And we're also the second from the bottom. We're serving 25, over 25,000 kids um, through our community schools and the community-based out-of-school time programs. On the public safety side, first on police. So, as I mentioned earlier, this budget we think represents a big step forward in modernizing the police department, and that's really in two ways. First, uh, we need a significant investment in technology in the department. There is uh, $16.8 million total in between the operating and the capital budget here. Um, 9.8 is for systems, uh, workforce development system, internal affairs system, use of force system, among others, that will put us, we think, on a path to compliance with the consent decree. We're required to track a lot of data for the consent decree, and we have to refresh and build these systems to do that. Uh, there's $2 million of, of technical staff to help build those systems, and then there's a $5 million investment to begin a replacement of police radios, which are, are out of service, uh, some of them which are out of service now, we need to begin replacement. On the scheduling side and the personnel side, two key things here. Uh, first, uh, we have a new patrol schedule, which we think will provide more uh, consistent coverage out in our neighborhoods and should reduce reliance on overtime. Uh, we also are civilianizing 62 positions in the department. So we're swapping out 62 sworn positions with 62 civilian positions, which we think will provide better service and some of the more administrative functions, professional functions, uh, like finance and IT, uh, the crime lab, and et cetera. Um, other parts of public safety, uh, the fire department is continuing their paramedicine program. This is a way, uh, a partnership with local hospitals, it's a grant program at the moment, uh, where they're pairing nurses with paramedics um, to improve care. The ultimate goal of this is to reduce the pressure on our EMS system, which has exploded in recent years. We're getting, uh, we've seen significant growth in the number of calls. The idea here is we can pair nurses with paramedics. We can potentially get folks the care they need, either through a primary care doctor or the urgent care system, rather than putting the pressure on our system. Um, and also, of course, as we mentioned, the traffic camera program uh, will be up to 100 and 100, uh, which generates re re revenue for the city, um, but also is a key uh, 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 element of our safety program, both pedestrian, bicyclist, and drivers. A couple highlights in terms of what this money gets us. We've, we expect to initiate uh, 350 arrests with the City Watch camera. That's the camera program. Um, and also want to call attention to uh, the state's attorney has additional funding to review expungement petitions. Um, and of course, we know now expungement is a key barrier to workforce development. That's a change in, in law that came into effect, I believe, last year. They're getting more petitions uh, to expunge criminal records, and they were adding staff so that they can keep up with that volume. On the quality of life side, uh, highlights here are mostly around the uh, HCD, uh, HCD community development framework. So first and foremost, there's money to continue the project core demolition investment that we're making. The fiscal 20 budget includes about $15 million of city investment, and the state has budgeted $18.7 million uh, of their resources to supplement that, uh, that investment. Uh, there's a uh, relatively new program called the Community Catalyst Grants Program. There is $5 million of general fund support this year for this program. This is a program that supports community-based revitalization efforts. There's $3 million in the capital budget for capital projects that are community-based, and there's $2 million, uh, which is new this year, of operating support for the program, which is meant to support organizations that do community development work to make sure that those, uh, those organizations are financially sound. Also this year, we're budgeting for the, the first full year of installment into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Um, it's an estimated 15 million that would go, 13 million from the new real estate tax, and there's a two million city contribution in the capital budget. And then finally on quality of life, uh, significant investment this year in, 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 in planning ahead for landfill development. So 
we worked pretty closely with planning department and DPW this summer to figure out what the remaining useful life of our landfill is. Uh, we're expected to be out of space by around fiscal 2026. The city has a trust fund where we've set many money aside, so we would be prepared for a development of a new or expanded site, but we need to accelerate those contributions this year and going forward. A total of $9.6 million this year in the budget, 6.6 .6 in the operating budget. Uh, as a contribution to the fund for future development, and three uh, in the capital budgets, in the capital budget, so the DPW can get going on the early stages of that project, uh, 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 study and design costs. <coughs> in terms of what this gives us uh, in quality of life, just a couple highlights: uh, we'll serve 700,000 meals through HCD Summer Food uh, Service Program, and the third one, we're serving uh, 61,000 seniors uh, through a variety of senior services in the health department. On economic development and jobs, uh, the fourth pillar, uh, a couple highlights. First, on visit Baltimore and Convention Center combined uh, $16 million of funding between those two agencies. Uh, we're expecting 500,000 visitors this year uh, to the Convention Center from uh, over 100 scheduled events. Um, we're looking ahead, the, the Convention Center is looking at a plan for potential expansion. Of course, the city will need to contribute to that. The state will contribute to that. We expect to know more about that as we get later in this calendar year. And then there is an additional 500000 investment to BOPA this year to support the Preakness. Um, again, with all the discussion this year about uh, Preakness and its future, uh, the city wants to make sure we have the best event possible and, and to keep that event in Baltimore due to the economic impact. A couple highlights on economic development and jobs. Uh, 30,000 people receive uh, you know, some kind of assistance on careers through our MOED's Career Center Network. And we will certify, the law department will certify over 1,400 minority or woman-owned businesses uh, this year with that funding. And then finally, the fifth pillar, accountability and transparency. Uh, we talked about some of the investments on the police side for IT. Uh, citywide, the BSIP budget includes, on the capital side, $9.7 million to continue that digital transformation plan, and the funds will be used to do infrastructure improvement, uh, cybersecurity, data storage, and backup, and disaster recovery. I just want to note here, this, was, this is not in response to what we saw. This was planned in the fall. This was, this was the information that we had shared even before the ransomware attack. Uh, the timing has been unfortunate, but there's been a lot of work uh, going on behind the scenes to try to... Uh, invest in IT and get us up to speed. And then related to that, uh, six million dollar investment to start uh, an enterprise resource planning system. That project would ultimately connect our finance, our payroll, our human resource systems, which are all operating separately today. And that should improve real-time data accessibility uh, and hopefully we think of eliminate redundant processes and save us money down the road. Um, in terms of uh, what the, the investment gets us, a couple highlights here. Um, Moit is addressing 890,000 calls per year through their 311 call center. And our goal is to engage uh, 3,000 residents this year in the, in the budget planning process. And we've been doing that, even started to do that with some council folks uh, so far uh, with community events to get folks understanding, learning more about the budget and getting some input from them about their priorities. Uh, we did have a... Um, uh, a competitive uh, process among agencies for enhancements this year for additional funding. We were very choiceful on these because we wanted to devote most of the surplus to one-time investments, which I'll talk about in a moment. But we did fund a handful of enhancements. Uh, some of these are recurring costs. We had over 30 requests from agencies. We funded six. Um, I'll touch on just a couple of these here. Uh, DGS Smarter Buildings is a $255,000 investment to put meters at city buildings to help us figure out where the uh, HVAC issues are and ultimately reduce energy costs. Uh, and the crime lab uh, asked for and received a $400,000 uh, enhancement for four new crime lab, crime lab analysts uh, focused on opioid related cases. So this is just a flavor of some of the things you'll see in more detail in the, in the agency detail book and from some of the hearings uh, next week. We, we always have a competitive process. We've had this for years now. We want to make sure though that the the requests that come in from agencies that we can really count on some kind of result uh, for that investment. So we have a competitive process where uh, our staff and other staff throughout the city review these requests and then share the findings with the, uh, with the mayor. And then in terms of the, the, the key, the key one-time investments, that $33 million that I spoke about earlier, that money uh, 
allowed us to do some, uh, make additional investments that we would not have been able to do within our normal capital funding. And we talked about the police IT systems, the ERP systems. Uh, there's $4.2 million of, of funding for public markets improvements. There's $5 million of additional demo funding that got us from 10 to 15 total. And then there's a variety of projects in Recreation and Parks, General Services, and DOT that were not on the original list able to be funded, but we were able to fund those with that additional one-time surplus. Our focus was on one-time surplus because we wanted to make sure that we can maintain, um, uh, be smart about planning for future years. This has been a, a good couple of years for the city financially, but we want to be prepared for what awaits us in fiscal 21 and beyond. Um, to wrap up, a couple of slides about other fund sources outside of the general fund. So first, on casino funding, you can see uh, we get casino funding from uh, a ground lease agreement with the operator of the casino, and then we get some impact aid in both South Baltimore uh, and the area around Park Heights. We also get some table games revenue that's split between education funding and rec and parks. The revenues have been, uh, you know, modest growth this year. The, the city's casino hasn't done, frankly, has not done very well, but a lot of the shared casino aid is, is a split between our casino and the other two casinos and the rest of the state. So a lot of this revenue is not driven by how well our casino does. It's a shared pot of state revenue that gets distributed uh, back as local impact aid. So even as our casino has not done as well as projected originally, that has not impacted us significantly yet. Um, and I'll note, too, that the first blue chunk, uh, that ground lease agreement, a, a lion's share of that money has helped pay for our property tax reduction, that 20 cents by 2020 program. Um, on the grant side, just a couple highlights here. Uh, state grants total $144.6 million this year for things like AIDS case management, circulator support, the convention center. Uh, and other programs. You'll see next week when the agencies come to discuss their budgets, there's a lot of detail in, uh, uh, that they'll provide, uh, more detail they'll provide about specific grants and what the trends are. And then on the federal side, 171 million of total uh, grant funding that we expect in fiscal 20 uh, for things like health services, Ryan White, human services, continuum of care, which is homeless services, uh, CDBG, which gets to spend on a variety of services and Head Start. The big story here for federal grant, we did get a new um, fire department has been supporting two fire companies with a SAFER grant. They call a SAFER grant. We applied for the next round of that, and we did receive a grant for the next three years, which will support uh, the personnel costs for two companies going forward. Um, there is a general fund match this time for that program, but it does support a bulk of the costs in the first year of two of our fire companies. Um, on the utility side, uh, the Board of Estimates has passed the rate increases on these, on these funds for the next three years through the end of fiscal 22. Um, you know, most of the investment here, of course, on the utility side is going to the, into the capital budget. Uh, and uh, these are the operating costs. And there's, again, more detail that DPW will be prepared to talk about about their plans for fiscal 20 on that front. And in terms of overall capital investment, I would just call your attention to what I would consider general fund backed capital investment, um, $50 million of uh, general fund PAYGO. Uh, we have $80 million of general obligation bonds and $15 million of county transportation bonds, which is state supported debt that we pay back. That's 145 million total of general fund backed investment by far the most we've had in over a decade. And again, our, our, our principle has been if we have one time resources, we have such a backlog of capital needs that we want to devote that to those needs first. Things like the IT, the public markets, the, the rec centers and things of that sort that we've talked about uh, uh, earlier. So that is just the, the highlights in a nutshell. I think that was uh, about under 20 minutes, but again, happy to take any questions from the council. Um, about the overview. And again, if there's any detailed questions, those of course can wait for the agencies when they're here next week, if it's very specific about their budget. Thanks, Bob. Uh, can you turn to slide 38 sure. for the additional investments? Uh, can you talk a little bit in more detail, and I apologize if I missed it, the three million for DGS and the two million for DOT? Sure, I'm sorry, it was 13, 38, right? 38. 38. So, um, I'm sorry, the question is general services. The, the bottom two items, yeah. Yeah, so. Um, the, and can you come a little closer to the mic because sure. this is being televised? Sure. So, on the general service side, they get an allocation each year in the 
in our geo bond allocation, our PAYGO allocation, and the projects they have, you know, far exceeds what they what's available. We were able to devote uh, an additional three million to them to focus on the highest priority needs. The needs at the moment, um, one of the big items is actually work on City Hall because we've had lots of issues with the, with the exterior. Um, so we're able to put more money towards that. On the DOT, um, I'll have to send you what that extra two million went for specifically, but it bumped up their availability, of course, beyond uh, what they typically get. We can send you a list of those specific projects. Okay, and that's obviously capital, right? Yeah, it's in the capital budget. We can send you what those were. Yeah, could you send, uh before we get started on budget hearings on Monday, could you send me some detailed breakdown for DGS and DOT for those two line sure. items? Sure, we can do that. And Bob, how is this $33 million stack impacted by what we just talked about with the fiscal impact of the cybersecurity attack? Yeah, so um, that's, a, that's a good question. I think, like we talked earlier, there's a, we were, I think fortunate in that we had a lot of investment already devoted to IT related stuff. Um, so some of the rebuild of what we're going to have to do would have been things that we wanted to upgrade anyway and we can charge some of those projects to that, to that, to that appropriation. In terms of the revenue impact, I think if we can get through this, this little um, hump, I don't think we should, we should see a longer term impact because like I said, the jet, uh, most of the general fund hasn't been affected, and the things where we're seeing issues is just the delay in uh, payments on certain citations and tickets. So those things will continue to be issued. You know, we've reached out to our DOT uh, uh, colleagues and housing colleagues to make sure that we're still issuing all the tickets and citations we usually do, and we still are doing that. So I think once we get through this bump and we get into 20, I don't think the ransomware thing uh, will have a huge effect in the, on the long term for the city's finances. It's really just going to be digging out of this, this response issue that we've had. Okay. So would it be safe to say that this $33 million stack of one-time investments, by and large, should not be negatively impacted by the cybersecurity attack? No, I don't think so. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Pinkett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, might as well stay on page 38. Can you speak to um, the Rec and Parks investment as well as the public markets improvement as well? Yeah, so same thing. We can send you um, a list of the a list of the specific projects that are in the budget this year. Um, just off the top of my head, remembering there's been, over time, there's been a, a lot of investment towards uh, rec centers to get them ready for reopening larger kind of beefed up rec centers. I know there's the Reed Bird facility uh, in Cherry Hill, there's some work on the Druid Hill um, Aquatic Center, but we can send you the list of specifics. That money went mostly towards uh, recreation facilities or aquatics facilities. Okay, and um, I'm sorry, in, in reference to the um, public markets, you, you have to, you're gonna report back on those as well? Sure, we can give you the list. It actually covers, um, it, it covers the final improvements to Cross Street, um, Cross Street and Broadway. It includes the Eastern Market um, and Lexington Market as well. I think it hits the, the four. Okay. The four I mean, it, it, the, the reason I'm asking is I, um, I know, and, and Councilman Costello knows that I think there's either RFP or there's some commitment to improve the, the Pennsylvania Avenue Market. And I just and, and I think there's a gap in funding as it relates to that. And so I just wanted to know. We can send you the details. There's investment for all of the markets that the city has at the moment. Yeah, including the Avenue. I Okay. Um, my, my second question is, and I was trying to find um, the, the graph from fiscal 2019, but um, on page seven, it shows, um, as it relates to the general fund budget revenue, 50% uh, of those revenues are from property taxes. Yes. Is, is that consistent with 2019, or is that consistent with recommendations? It just, it, it just seems like, it seems high, but... Yeah, it's, it's high. It's, it's, it's a little bit higher than it was last year uh -huh. um, because the growth in property taxes has been uh, strong and stronger than some of our revenue sources. It, to, be, to be frank with you, it, it, you know, anytime you have one source that's, that's that you big of a share of the pot, it's making to. me a little bit nervous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, the, the property tax revenue, the good news about property tax is that because of the way it's structured where uh, your ta uh, homeowner's taxes can't go up by more than 4% per year because of the homestead tax credit. It kind of protects us from kind of the excess if we're seeing a rapidly increasing market, but also helps us on the downside. So if you remember um, in our property tax revenue from fiscal 11 to 14, mm -hmm. we actually had assessment declines 
when we went back and reassessed all those years, but we had built up value that hadn't been taxed because of the homestead tax credit law that helped kind of cushion us through that, through that downturn. So property tax is a large percent of our revenue. That's pretty typical for Maryland. That's just the way the system is. Um, but it's kind of bordering on it's getting a little bit too, and we have to look at ways of diversifying our, our revenue streams for sure. Okay. Um, yeah, if we could, I, I don't know how you would report back to us, you know, the progress as it relates to diversifying, but I, I, I would be very curious to see that. And, and just to dovetail on that, because you, you also mentioned that the um, reduction in the property tax was costing us $36 million. Yes. So, like, um, is, is a part of that analysis the, uh, the fact that the reduction might be an incentive for, you know, people to buy into the city or to yeah absolutely uh the the principle of the plan when it started back in 2013 was that we had to reduce the burden on folks who live here mm -hmm. so this benefit just goes to uh owners that are residents of the city it doesn't go it's not a general rate relief um, now that we've met that i think we'll relook at that going forward and see if we want to broaden the relief to other parts but um, the idea was we wanted to lower the effective rate for folks that will live here as an incentive to get folks to either move here or stay. Gotcha. Um, okay. So that, that clarifies. I, I thought this was in order to attract. This is just for um, individuals who are already property owners. Yeah, in the but city. if you purchase a property here and you live in that property, you're eligible for the credit. So your effective tax rate is lower, too, mm -hmm. as well. So it's for people that already own. And if you purchase a home in the city and live in it, um, it also you also are eligible for that tax credit. Okay. Um, we, we can talk later about that. Sure. Thank you. Councilman Henry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry. I had kept switching pages to follow our colleagues' questions. Um, on page 11, I just wanted to um, make sure that I got all of that information on the targeted homeowners sure. tax credit. Um, you said that the cost of that this year is $36 million? It's about $36 million annually, the cost of that credit. All those savings go back to taxpayers residential that are residential owner-occupied properties. Um, I wanted to check this year to see if that tax credit were either phased out or eliminated, what would be the corresponding cut to the overall tax rate with that same amount of money? Um, let me make sure I understand your question. So the, the, the base tax rate is still $2.24 cent dollars per $100 of assessed value. The effect of the tax credit cumulatively over time is it, ha it has reduced for, a, again, a, a residential owner-occupied property, they're paying effectively $2.04. Dollars. So if we phase it out over time, the rate for those people would be the base rate of $2.24. No, not for those people. I'm saying that if you took that $36 million and simply lowered the property tax rate so that... Just across, councilman across the board Across cut. the yeah, board. Right. Across the board cut. We, we can do the calculation. We can, we can get back to you. I don't have the specific amount, but we, have the, we can do a rough calculation okay. and tell you that. All right. Thank you. I think Pedro's got it on his calculator right now. That's a quick one. <laughs> right? Gen general fund property tax revenue divided by. Well, we, we can go to the next question. We'll try to. Yeah, we'll we're just yeah. doing a rough, rough calculation. You, you, they, they can just get back to me. If I, if I were a betting man, I would say it's about nine cents. Nine cents. That's the, 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 reason, the reason I was curious <laughs> was that when we first instituted the targeted homestead tax credit, at the time, the projection was it would be about between 12 and 13 cents. Um, eight, eight cents. I, I'm saying, and, and that's what I'm saying is that over the years since we started, the practical effect now is it would only save eight cents on the actual tax rate, yet home owner occupiers are getting an effective 20 cent cut. Yeah, okay. that's right. We're basically, we're basically targeting it out to that one population so that they get a bigger benefit okay. for folks that are living here. All right, thank you. It doesn't you. apply to commercial, of course. It doesn't apply to commercial or residential that live outside the city. Councilwoman Clark. Uh, can, I, can I go back to, um, oh, what pages? Um, the pages about uh, 
pensions, uh, about um, the prescription drug and the, the, the multicolored, all right, let me just say my questions. Okay, right. Yeah, I think so. I'm like, I lost the page. <clears throat> uh, we, um, what, what is the status, please, of the prescription drug program for retirees that was not decided but was, there was a commitment made by the finance director that there would be a city sponsored prescription program going forward that that to really take effect in fiscal 2020 um, and to originally it was all the notion of increasing um, increasing membership fees was that the uh, Affordable Care Act was going to kick in with a Medicaid boost that would pick up the difference. Yes. So I, I am asking where we, we stand with all that deliberation because there was going to be a comeback to discuss with the um, retirees before any final decisions. Right, so um, the, the commitment is still there that we, we will still sponsor a plan. Okay. Um, the Affordable Care Act has, um, we think, has given us some flexibility to look at options that could save the city money. We are currently evaluating those, but we're not ready to, uh, we haven't wrapped up the analysis yet. Uh, we're working with HR and then our consultants, our healthcare mm -hmm. consultants, to see what the possibilities are. Um, I mean, in a nutshell, the Affordable Care Act does close what they call the donut hole, which is some of the coverage gap uh, for Medicare folks. Um, so we're looking at possibilities, but either way we go, we still will sponsor a sponsor some kind of plan, but the plans might look different and there could be different options for retirees. And there is a, uh, and so in this budget, there is not a plan going forward. There, there's not any change to the current a plan. A change to the current plan, and that change will evolve in the year to come. Yes, we're and still the, And the beneficiary representatives um, will be Will, will be included before it's finally done. Right. Um, the other question I had is we get a lot, there are a lot of, there is a lot of grief over the 20% issue um, for benefits to retirees of the city of Baltimore. You're talking about you know the- know what I'm talking about. You're talking about. about the share that they pay for- The share they're paying that they didn't pay before. Mm -hmm. So what does that represent in savings to the city of Baltimore over like two comparative before and after years? Yeah, so what- What page what, is that anyway? That's um, 20, page 20. So what, what this graph is, is, now this is all healthcare costs. This is both active and retirees. So you've got them all mixed. It's all, it's all mixed. I, I'm just system. talking right now, when maybe you have to go back and come back with the number. Yeah, well, right now, I'm talking about retirees. OK. So, so we'll give you the specifics. This is all mixed together, so we'll have yeah, to get I you got the numbers. You. But you know, generally, what the, what the gray bar is meant to represent is this is what our healthcare costs would have looked like if we did nothing. So the growth rate of that graph is, is essentially what the growth rate of the healthcare market looked like. And the green is what our actual healthcare costs have been. Um, and again, the two big reforms were the one that you spoke of, which is for actors and retirees to ask for a larger share. Um, the 20% the yeah, plan. 20% roughly for most of the plans. And then uh, there's been some other work over that time. So the big one in fiscal 18 was rebidding the plans and getting the savings from from the competitive market. And we also consolidated on the active side. We had, uh, I think, nine plans before. Yes, you'd reduce. Now we only have four. We have a standard and a high option for a typical health plan and then a couple of it's HMO options. Pay. So the net of all that is the green line is here's what it looks like with the actions that we've taken. And the gray is what it would have looked like if we just did nothing and just kept the plans the same. So um, 
you know, just doing the math, it's well over $100 million of savings among all funds, but we'll have to break out just the retiree. If you, if you could, um, to the, for the committee, if you could break out the, the, the two things. One, the, well, you haven't changed the, you haven't changed the uh, pre retiree prescription plan yet. It's still there. No. So we, I guess we'll just have to do that in the year to come when it's up for reactivation. Yeah, okay. We're, we're, I can tell you, for, we're looking at it now um, for sure. I don't have anything detailed to share yet, but we're looking to see how we can better position ourselves now that we know the Affordable Care Act is here and kind of the changes that have been in place there. Are there ways we can restructure our plans and protect folks um, and provide a good benefit, but, but look and see if there's other additional ways for the city to save money? It's important, so just so everybody gets a chance to participate before there's a plan, um, yep. and that we get some, and that we haven't been trumped out totally of a, a future um, with regard to the Affordable Care Act or its provisions, I wouldn't want to hang people out on that. And and then I'd be interested if if you have time and you can for. Um, for the um, effect of the 20% addition on the retirees as one group, them, to retirees. Okay, yeah, we can break that out. What, what, you, what you're saving as the, from that group. Yeah, well, we can break that out. Because we got some people well. out there, it's wrong what they're living on in terms of income. Thank you. Sure. Councilwoman Middleton. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to add to my colleague, um, her conversation was really based on the uh, aging retirees and aging adult. Right. And um, I noticed on, pay, on the um, five, mayor's five pillars on page 23, um, I was sitting there trying to think, well, where are you going to show that you are also helping the 50 and 55 and old right. um, population that's in the city and you know are there is there money that's going to be put in some of these senior centers um, I, and I'm looking at the one quality of life I don't know if you there needs to be something written and present to show that you there is some focus on because we have a very large uh, mature adult population as well in the city Right. And I know that um, there's initiatives to really push, um, you know, the aging commission and and just think that that whole department, because there's been some neglect there over over the years, and we do have um, areas in our city that need a focus on helping that population and their quality of life and assist in any way we can, not just for, um, you know, retirees of the city, but the total population right. that's coming in. Yeah, so um, to answer the first card, in terms of these indicators, I can tell you that over many years we've tried to boil, like, a lot of things the city is doing into just, from a, think of it as almost like a very high-level report card, how are we doing on some key areas. It doesn't mean that there's not other important work, of course, going on. And for the seniors, particularly when we get into the health department hearing next week, there's a variety of measures about what we're doing and how we're serving the, uh, the senior population that are under those services. Um, there was a lot of things that we tried to, had to flush out just to kind of keep this as simple as possible. But there's a ton of measures uh, for those services in the first volume of the agency detail under those care services that you can see all the things we're doing for, uh, for that community, mm -hmm. for that population. And I know that like, there's some departments that do, do things like the recre um, recreation and parks and so on, but we need to have a focus that people can actually see, and that's been part of the problem. They, everything has been separated so much in other agencies that we kind of lost our touch and we're not up to date with our surrounding counties with opportunities for the um, mature adult. Okay. Yeah, but I'm sure Health can speak in more detail about that at their, okay. at their hearing. Councilwoman Sneed. Thank you. 
Just I'm curious how much it would cost for us if every City Watch uh, camera was up and working. Uh, I do, we'll have to follow up with you. I don't have that in front of me. I know there's a certain portion. I saw the news report that there's some that are down. Yeah. Um, so we can look that up and we can get that back to you. Okay. Colleagues, if there's no other questions, um, this hearing will go into recess until Monday morning at 9 a.m. Next up is uh, Council Bill 19-0388, Operating Budget for the Baltimore City Board of School Commissioners for the fiscal year ending June 30, 2020. Mr. Walker, you're up. Uh, just as a reminder, we have taxpayer night starting in 17 minutes. Uh, if you could do your best to get through the presentation in about 10, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, just to uh, go through a few things quickly. Um, we do have our budget hearing is scheduled for Monday evening, so we will be back to be giving you a much more detailed presentation. This is just a, a quick um, update and overall of the financial portions of the budget for fiscal year 20. Even though our resources still remain significantly below what we need, um, we were able to plan in fiscal year 20 with a sense of stability because our revenues um, were, plat were flat from the front, from the prior year, they did not go down. Uh, we're still under the Thornton formula from the state, and as a result, we were able to get $11 million additional from the state to remain flat, even though our revenue had declined a bit. <clears throat> um, we spent a lot of time in the community um, and did a lot of district level meetings and a lot of school level meetings to get a lot of community input into this budget as we were putting it together. Uh, I'll give you a quick note about Kerwin. Um, the, we have received, or we, we will receive, approximately $50 million total from the state that will come from Kerwin. However, that additional money came after this budget had been uh, produced and adopted. It will be, um, and it comes with a lot of strings, too. So we're still trying to evaluate about exactly how we can use some of the money that's coming from the state. Some of it's for teacher salary increases, some of it's for special education. Um, a, a significant portion is for what they're calling concentrations of poverty. And we're still working on the best ways that we can, um, we can leverage that money in our budget. So we will be putting forth a supplemental appropriation probably sometime in July that will include that $50 million increase. So that is not included in the budget that is being presented, uh, being presented now. On the revenue side, uh, quickly, our general fund revenue is um, estimated to be $1.162 billion. Our special or grant funds at $104.9 million. And our enterprise fund, <coughs> excuse me, which is our uh, food, nutri <coughs> excuse me, food nutrition fund at $55.3 million for a total of $1.322 billion. This is how our general fund revenue breaks down. Uh, as you know, most of our general fund revenue comes from uh, the state of Maryland and Baltimore City, so it's pretty fixed. We know what it is at the beginning of the year. <clears throat> uh, we just th put this slide in for you to take a look at. These are all the various components of the state funding formula, the, the existing Thornton formula, and how things are calculated. And uh, we just put this in there for information. Uh, the special fund summary, as I said, it's um, $105 million for fiscal year 20. The largest portions of those grants are um, federal Title I and federal Title II for students with disabilities. Uh, and, uh, uh, the other revenue sources, as we said, are um, <clears throat> our, um, our cafeteria fund at $55 million. We also have a, a $22 million contribution from fund balance included in this budget. And as I said before, we didn't get to get all the Kerwin stuff in, so we had to put this $22 million contribution in for now. We don't expect it to be that. We expect to be able to reduce that as a result of the additional dollars we got, but we're still trying to figure out how, we, how it is that we can spend it within the, the constraints of the laws that were passed. <clears throat> On the allocation side, our general fund allocation is $1.162 billion. Uh, $780 million of that went directly to schools and schools and school budgets. And another $382 million was uh, centrally budgeted allocations, not central office, but things that are centrally budgeted. And uh, there's, a, there's a graph um, down the line that kind of breaks this down for you. 
Uh, this just shows you how our direct school allocations uh, were made. $333 million went through our uh, fair student funding formula. $215 million was in locked funds for in our fair student funding formula. That's for things like um, principals and certain special education, um, English language learners, uh, uh, teachers, and so forth. Another $138 million went to charter schools. Um, unlocked student with disability funds was $76 million. 15.7 million was uh, allocated for alternative option programs in schools. And then we had another 2.4 million of some targeted money, and that targeted money is for uh, certain things. We have a, a few schools that, that lease buildings or, or rent space. Uh, we also have some IB programs and some other things that we give targeted funding outside of the, outside of the formula. The per pupil change from fiscal year 18 to 20 is shown here and show that our proposal for fiscal year 20 has an increase of our traditional school per pupil of $5,590, where it was $5,521 in the adopted budget, and then $5,543 after enrollment adjustments. On the charter school side, we're recommending $9,108 per pupil in fiscal year 20, which is up from 9,017 in the adopted budget, and 9,002 in the amount that was calculated as a result of the enrollment adjustment. These are the district office allocations by, uh, by office in all the different offices. This is the general funds budget distribution. Um, let's get this one on here. Um, what you'll see is this is how we have it broken down for our budget distribution. And this is the amount of school supports that are budgeted centrally. And, and why we show this slide is because, as I said before, we had $382 million that was uh, budgeted centrally. However, of that, only about 7% of that is our, our district office or our central office. The other things that are budgeted centrally are things like utilities and transportation, um, certain professional service contracts, and our chief academic officer um, uh, in the chief academic officer's office where they are budgeted centrally, but they are used on behalf of schools. And that does it for me. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Um, Councilman Costello will be very proud of you. <laughs> um, I just, just had a couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the general fund revenue projection breakdown, mm -hmm. um, can you tell us what, what's the, the um, reasoning or what, what's causing the, the um, decrease in the federal revenue? It's E-rate revenue. It's the money we receive at E-rate. Uh -huh. And so the programs are down for fiscal year 2020. <clears throat> okay. Um, and um, you mentioned the um, increase in the contribution from the fund balance, mm -hmm. um, 22 million for right. FY20. Um, and the potential for some of that um, money being covered by the 50 million Correct. that you anticipate. So when you, when you, when you say, when you, when you talk about the money that, that we anticipate receiving, are you considering covering all of the fund balance contribution or just the increase from last fiscal year? Well, our, our hope was to get our fund balance to continue to reduce our reliance on fund balance as years went through. It was $15 million, $15 million in 19, I think it was like $25 million or $22 million in fiscal year 18, mm -hmm. and $53 million in, in 17. So we, our, our idea is to try to get it down. We'd hope to get it down below $10 million um, at least. Uh, we may be able to do a little bit better based on the revenue, the, the additional resources we've gotten from the state. But as I said, they have so many strings attached to them, we have to make sure um, uh, we, we don't know how we can spend those monies generally. A lot of them are targeted. Okay. Um, I think I just had one other question, and, and, I, and, and you, I guess you might get into this, well, I'm assuming you'll get into this more on Monday, but um, did, are you able to speak a little bit about the, um, I guess, the creation, it looks like a new office or a new position, Chief Communications and Community Engagement Officer, it looks like 3.74 million um, increase over last year for that particular service. Yes, what it was is that we, we moved a couple offices together. We had a communications office, we had a um, family and community engagement office, and we also had an enrollment choice and transfer office, and they were located in different areas where at the district. They've been brought together under one office, 
and that office is now run by the new chief communication. Okay, so, so m much of this are functions that were already happening, but just a happening lot of in it. different. Yeah, yeah. Okay. most of the increase was just a, a, couple of, a couple of FTEs, I believe. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Mr. Walker, uh, thanks for taking the time to meet earlier. And um, obviously one of the things that's of great interest to me is what the city's contribution is going to be, need to be next year. Uh, especially in light of Kerwin, so looking forward to having that discussion in much greater detail, uh, I believe, on Monday. So okay. thank you very much. Okay. Colleagues, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Colleagues? Okay, we're now in recess until Monday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. We're going to be in recess for seven minutes, and then we're going to get started.